Round these there was a margin, obscurely and imperfectly described in the reports of merchants, but by far the greater part of the world was utterly unknown. Great realms of darkness stretched all beyond, and closely hemmed in the little circle of light. In these unknown lands our ancestors loved to picture everything that was strange and mysterious. They believed that the man who could penetrate far enough would find countries where inexhaustible riches were to be gathered without toil from fertile shores or marvelous valleys. And though wild tales were told of the dangers supposed to fill these regions, yet to the more daring and adventurous, these only made the visions of boundless wealth and enchanting loveliness seem more fascinating. Thus, as the art of navigation improved and long voyages became possible, courageous seamen were tempted to venture out into the great unknown expanse. There was, however, an enthusiastic seaman who firmly believed that a great continent existed there and who longed to go in search of it. This was De Quiros, a Spaniard who had already sailed with a famous voyager and now desired to set out on an expedition of his own. And three months after setting out, he saw a rocky shore in the distance. Stormy weather coming on, he was driven out to sea, and it was not till a week later that he was able to reach the coast again. He called the place Van Diemen's Land, and sent some sailors on shore to examine the country. These men heard strange noises in the woods, and saw trees of enormous height, in which notches were cut seven feet apart. These they believed to be the steps used by the natives in climbing the trees, and therefore returned to report that the land was exceedingly beautiful, but inhabited by men of gigantic size. But, having himself seen, from his ship, what he thought to be men of extraordinary stature moving about on the shore, he lost no time in taking up his anchor and setting sail. The land was filled by high mountains, verdure clad to their summits and sending down fine streams, which fell in hoarse sounding waterfalls from the edges of the rocky shore, or wandered amid tropical luxuriance of plants down to the golden sands that lay within the coral barriers. The inhabitants came down to the edge of the green and shining waters, making signs of peace. And twenty soldiers went ashore, along with an officer, who made friends with them, exchanging cloth for pigs and fruit. The Quiros coasted along the islands for a day or two till he entered a fine bay, where his vessels anchored and Torres went ashore. A chief came down to meet him, offering him a present of fruit, and making signs to show that he did not wish the Spaniards to intrude upon his land. As Torres paid no attention, the chief drew a line upon the sand and defied the Spaniards to cross it. Torres immediately stepped over it and the natives launched some arrows at him, which dropped harmlessly from his iron armor. The Spaniards spent a few pleasant days among the fruit plantations and slept in cool groves of overarching foliage, but subsequently they had quarrels and combats with the natives, of whom they killed a considerable number. When the Spaniards had taken on board a sufficient supply of wood and of fresh water, they set sail, but had scarcely got out to sea when a fever spread among the crew and became a perfect plague. They returned and anchored in the bay, where the vessels lay like so many hospitals. No one died, and after a few days they again put to sea, this time to be driven back again by bad weather. From their colony at Java they sent out a small vessel, the Dyphon or Dove, which sailed into the Gulf of Carpentaria and passed halfway down along its eastern side. Some sailors landed, but so many of them were killed by the natives that the captain was glad to embark again and sail for home, after calling the place of their disaster Cape Kiavea or Chernigan. 
After a short stay, they again set out towards the north, making a rough chart of the shores they saw. In this way, they had sailed along 1300 miles without serious mishap, when one night, at about 11 o'clock, they found the sea grow very shallow. All hands were quickly on deck, but before the ship could be turned, she struck heavily on a sunken rock. No land was to be seen, and they therefore concluded that it was upon a bank of coral they had struck. The vessel seemed to rest upon the ridge, but as the swell of the ocean rolled past, she bumped very heavily. Most of the cannons and other heavy articles were thrown overboard, and, the ship being thus lightened, they tried to float her off at daybreak. This they were unable to do, but, by working hard all next day, they prepared everything for a great effort at the evening tide, and had the satisfaction of seeing the rising waters float the vessel off. A small vessel, the Endeavour, was chosen. Astronomers with their instruments embarked, and the whole placed under the charge of James Cook, a sailor whose admirable character fully merited this distinction. At thirteen, he had been a shopkeeper's assistant, but, preferring the sea, he had become an apprentice in a coal vessel. After many years of rude life in this trade, during which he contrived to carry on his education in mathematics and navigation, he entered the Royal Navy, and by diligence and honesty rose to the rank of master. He had completed so many excellent surveys in North America, and, besides, had made himself so well acquainted with astronomy, that the government had no hesitation in making their choice. That it was a wise one, the care and success of Cook fully showed. He carried the expedition safely to Tahiti, built fortifications, and erected instruments for the observations, which were admirably made. Having finished this part of the task, he thought it would be a pity, with so fine a ship and crew, not to make some discoveries in these little-known seas. Standing to the northeast, he sailed along the coast till he reached a fine bay, where he anchored for about ten days. On his first landing he was opposed by two of the natives, who seemed quite ready to encounter more than forty armed men. Cook endeavoured to gain their good will, but without success. A musket fired between them startled, but did not dismay them, and when some small shot was fired into the legs of one of them, though he turned and ran into his hut, it was only for the purpose of putting on a shield and again facing the white men. Here we have more evidence of a one-world architectural style, stretching from continent to continent, tip to tip. We also have more evidence from the historical record that as explorers went out exploring the world, they began to encounter men of enormous stature. When we examine the quote-unquote mainstream narrative, we are led to believe that this city was constructed from untouched land and turned into a fully built-out city in just over a century from the time of these photographs. Then, when we do some critical thinking, we realize that the city location was very, very remote and passage there was extremely long, dangerous, and an expensive endeavor. The initial raw materials and supplies to begin to build this city would have had to have come aboard merchant ships, which at that time had limited cargo space and were slow in their arrival. Also, the amount of skilled laborers to do all the construction was limited as the population of the world was said to have been much smaller. When we take all these factors into consideration, it becomes difficult to imagine that the mainstream narrative would be true. We begin to doubt that so few men, with so limited resources, at a dangerous and remote location, thousands of miles from home, could have built these amazing cities in such a shortened time frame that we are given. I feel strongly that this city is another example of the old world civilization that existed before our civilization. 
The history that we are taught is most likely false, and those who have the influence and those who write the history books have intentionally covered up the true history of the world, erased the previous civilization from the record, and have dishonestly stepped in to take responsibility for the construction of these old world cities. The architecture in this city is identical to cities all across the face of the earth. In the LibriVox recording, we hear an account of a plague, a perfect plague, hitting the mariners on board the ships, which sounds very dire for that time. What did they do to address the plague? They went to shore, they rested for a couple of days, nobody died, and they went on their journey. The photographs and films in this presentation are from the public domain. They are free to use and free from copyright. The audio recording is a LibriVox recording, which is also in the public domain and free to use without copyright. Excerpts were taken from the audiobook recording. <laughs> 